at one point they say like the CIA placed me in my role at Stanford, which is surreal. Like the agency waited 20 years <laughs> after <laughs> I left, you know, and I left at a time before Twitter existed, yet they somehow knew that like I would be useful for this top secret mission somewhere down the line. I mean, these are the things that you're being asked to believe when you think about them for 30 seconds. They, they, they beggar belief, right? They defy common sense. All right. I am joined today by Renee Doresta. Renee, thank you for being on Urgent Futures. Thanks for having me. Some people say that you are CIA Renee. <laughs> um, who actually are you and uh, <laughs> what, what animates the research behind your incredible book, Invisible Rulers? Yeah. So I interned for the agency when I was a kid. Um, I was a, a summer intern, um, 99 to 04 or so. So it was an interesting time to be there. Um, September 11th happened while I was there. It was definitely a, a you know, wild, um, wild thing to kind of see even from an extremely junior capacity on the inside. Uh, but I didn't stay. I, um, I went and I joined a quant trading firm. Um, I did it because I thought I wanted to go to law school and I needed a place to like park myself in New York and, you know, Wall Street was there. Um, then I really liked it, did that for eight years, uh, went out to the Valley, did some venture capital as my kind of career transition to familiarize myself with Silicon Valley, started a couple companies. Um, and then honestly, I like I describe in the book, I... Um, I was just really, I was, you know, I've sort of always been an early adopter. I was on the internet and you know, had my first blog when it was GeoCities and um, was a big, you know, user of social networks as they came out. So I was a big Twitter user early on, starting in around maybe 2009 or so. Um, and, and I just wound up starting to pay a lot of attention as I had my first baby in 2013. I had him in December, 2013. By 2014, I was paying a lot of attention to narratives on social media related to motherhood. Um, and I got very involved in the vaccine conversation from a pro-vaccine standpoint. I had just moved out to California also, moved in 2011. And um, I got very involved in some like California vaccine policies after the Disneyland measles outbreak. And uh, you know, honestly, it was just sort of, I was kind of motivated by the the curiosity of like, how do these things work? Like, what is the, what is the system that is operating here? Uh, how do people exploit the system? How can other people push back against that? How can uh, pro-vaccine communities have as visible a space on the, you know, on these platforms as anti-vaccine communities clearly do? And, uh, you know, I think all, all my different careers I've worked on complicated, complex systems and uh, trying to understand how they work, what makes them tick. And it was the same thing here. Amazing. Yeah. And can you share a little bit? Cause you, 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 you walk us into the book with this anecdote with the anti-vax community and sort of like the kind of like head blown back moment of like, oh, wow. Um, so I'd love if you could share that in a little bit more detail. Yeah. So I was one of the first people in my friend group to have kids. Um, I was 32. So I realized that in most parts of the country, <laughs> that sounds maybe a little bit late. Um, but, uh, you know, I was living in New York and then in San Francisco and I got very involved in um, like mommy communities online because I, you know, I, it was literally like what to expect, right? What do, what do you, what happens when you're pregnant? What happens when you have this baby? How do you make it sleep? How do you like, you know, how do I get my boy to eat? You know, all these, all these kinds of questions. And so, um, so I really turned to the internet for that information. And also because you could do it anonymously, you could do it in a judgment-free way on Facebook. Obviously you had your face attached, but on other places um, you could ask hard questions and, and, and people would help you figure things out. But one thing that happens when you're trying to figure things out is that also a lot of um, well-meaning uh, people, but with bad information, are in the conversation as well. This is just the way that you know that humans communicate. But what I noticed with social media platforms was that, particularly on Facebook, as I was engaging, as I was joining more mom communities, like I cloth diapered, <laughs> I made my own baby food, and and the Facebook recommendation system decided I was like a crunchy mom, right? Um, which I am not, but that was, you know, it's reasonable, it's a reasonable intuition. And it started pushing me all these anti-vaccine groups. And I was really struck by that because um, I am, you know, stridently pro-vaccine, right? And and I have been my entire life. And, and I was sort of horrified 
by the fact that this was being pushed to me, right? I felt like I felt like the platform was doing the recruiting work, right? Was was doing the um, you know, hey, you're active in mom groups, you should join this 200,000 person <laughs> group that's that exists to to pretend that vaccines cause SIDS, right? Or or that vaccines cause autism. And and I just felt like it was um I felt like it was backwards. I felt like it was actually profoundly unethical too. I felt like there was a big difference between having those communities exist for people who wanted to join them and having it just sort of push that at you. And so I started uh, I started writing about it just as a person in Silicon Valley with opinions about tech, right? As as that's what you are when you're in venture capital. And I, and I was uh, in VC moving into doing my own company at the time. And I started writing about questions related to, to tech ethics to recommender systems to how curation works and uh you know because i was in the valley i also engaged with people at platforms about this like these were people who i was friends with who just happened to work in big tech and so i became that person at breakfast who'd be like okay let's talk about what your thing is pushing me today <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, that was that was pretty much it that was the for me the motivation really was one, a, a sense of curiosity about the system, how it worked and how it should work, right? Um, and then B, from a personal standpoint, um, you know, I had to enroll my child in daycare and in kindergarten. And the idea that um, misguided beliefs about measles vaccines would lead to him being put at risk of measles before he was old enough to be vaccinated struck me again as profoundly unethical. And, uh, and I wanted to do something about it. Mm. Yeah, you have a couple quotes that I want to string together um, to kind of build on that. Um, one, uh, very simply, is the internet is where reality is made. But in in orienting us to the book and framing that it's not just a book about social media, um, you write, rather, my focus is on a profound transformation in the dynamics of power and influence, which have fundamentally shifted and on how we, the citizens, can come to grips with a force that is altering our politics, our society, and our very relationship to reality. I'd love to invite you just to explain more about that. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll keep going with the vaccine example then, since um, one of the things I know we, I, I've just kind of covered it in the context of the algorithm um, and, and then my sort of personal kind of intersection with the algorithm. But one of the things that happens when you join these groups, and I did, I did join some, um, cause I wanted to see what went on in there. Right. And I, I did it with a different account. I made a whole new account just so I could go join. And I wasn't in research. This is just, again, you know, um, me as a, as an interested mom, um, because I wanted to see what happened once you were in there. And I didn't want to like pollute my recommendation system further by indicating that I had a sincere interest in this. And I just, you know, I just sat, I just read, I just read the groups, right? I didn't engage, I didn't talk. Um, but what you saw was people who were deeply questioning, right? They, they had real concerns. They felt that the public health was not really speaking to them. They didn't feel that it was very convincing. And instead they had this entire like stable of alt experts, you might call them, right? People who told them what they wanted to hear, people who gave them the validation that they were looking for. And I was interested in this from the perspective of um, how those relationships like continued to influence opinions, how you would see people really become very vocal activists as they established this support system of the like-minded, right? They, they found the support in these groups and then that inspired them. Okay, let's all create Twitter accounts, you guys, you know, things like this. Let's all use this hashtag. Let's all post this thing. Let's all boost this YouTube video. So it was very sort of coordinated community of people who were very passionate about it, sort of activism, right? As, as you have. Um, but there was also this whole stable of influencers, even ones who had been quite demonstrably rebuked by public health and the sort of, uh, you know, scientific journals like Andy Wakefield, the sort of canonical uh, doctor who wrote the paper claiming that vaccines caused autism, who lost his license, right, who was sort of stricken from the register, that paper was retracted. Many, many, many articles were written about that, that retraction process and, and, the, and why it happened. But in these groups, he was an influencer. He was a hero. He was a person bravely bucking the medical establishment. And this is, I think, in part because you had moms who were really struggling 
right, who were who had uh, nonverbal children who had uh, become convinced that the reason that their children were struggling was because of the shots that they had given them. And so then there was a sense of personal guilt there as well, right? I didn't know, so I'm going to evangelize and make sure everybody else knows and doesn't repeat my mistakes. And so I was sort of fascinated watching this set of, you know, just the way in which like, yes, the algorithm is boosting this to me, but that's happening because these are very, very highly engaged groups. It's not happening in a vacuum. And they're very, very engaged because people are looking for something and they're getting it here in a way that they're not getting from their doctors. And, you know, and, and I um, I wound up going to a CDC conference in... I want to say it was maybe 2016, late 2015, maybe early 2016. I'm trying to remember the exact dates. I, I mentioned it in the book. And I had a conversation about some network mapping I had done and you know, detailing how these influencers and crowds operated on Twitter. And I had this sort of funny interaction um, with some of the folks who were there from the CDC saying like, well, that's just some people on the internet. You know, because I said, why don't why aren't you guys in this conversation? You're really not in this conversation in a very fundamental way. You have no influence in it. You have no what we call in network analysis like high centrality nodes. There is no public health voice that is central to this conversation that is shaping this conversation. And you're sort of relying on legacy authority combined with a hope that people's personal relationship with their individual physician is enough to make that individual person vaccinate. But writ large, you are not in this conversation. And, and just watching that that gap, they didn't understand the power of storytelling. They didn't understand the the sort of the validation that people got in these groups. Um, and and so I, I was really sort of struck by that as well. <laughs> and then, of course, that plays out in very dramatic ways. Um, five years later or so during COVID, four years later. Yeah. You do a really good job differentiating between the rumor mill and misinformation or what we call misinformation and propaganda. And I feel like this is maybe a good moment thinking about, um, well, actually, I have a question before that that's sort of not, that's like less direct about the book, which is when you made this alternative account, um, were you engaging? Were you commenting all or just purely? No, 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 no. I didn't want to comment. I wasn't there to, you know, to, to try to sway opinions or anything. I wouldn't have really even known how to go about doing that. I just wanted to see what it was about these groups that was so compelling, right? What, what was it that was, um, you know, and then also from the standpoint of somebody who is pro vaccine and was starting a pro vaccine group, you know, what are the things that people need to be responding to? What are the questions? What are the, uh, what are the arguments that make this community so compelling? How does it essentially recruit people, if you will, and then and, and pull it in? So no, I had no interest in in commenting or anything like that. It's funny because Facebook did at one point like take the account down, you know? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, no, this was still when they were like doing that whole, like you periodically get a, a request to like, um, you know, show your ID or something along those lines. So yes, no, this was very uh, sort of funny to me to to watch that happen too, then to, you know, to see where, right. where Facebook's uh, um, kind of like auto mods <laughs> right. came right. in. That's and, the account that gets taken down. Right, right, right. Exactly. Well, I think this was sort of a, it was sort of a funny thing too, because um, this was an interesting time when, as we were starting the, the counter groups, right, the pro vaccine parent groups, there were definitely anti-vaccine activists who were being served our content, right, through Facebook's recommender system or whatever, perhaps, or, or they just went looking for it, who then would join our groups. And so it was this sort of funny, like, you know, um, spy versus spy kind of uh, <laughs> <Facebook> <laughs> dynamic, <spy> right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in academia, in academia, if you want to join a private group, you have to file IRB, right? You have to you have to file reports. You have to disclose yourself. Um, it's it's a very different process. So, in none of my actual academic work, which started about again four years later, um, did we use any you know fake accounts or join any private groups or anything like that? Just to be clear, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so back to the question that I wanted to build off um, of your previous point is um, asking you to to do that differentiating work of the rumor mill versus misinformation mm -hmm. versus propaganda, because I think it really gets at something that a lot of people, even internet literate people, don't really appreciate. So misinformation was an interesting term. And it, so it means people who are sort of information that is wrong, but it's usually referred to, it's usually used to refer to people who are sharing it inadvertently. They just happen to be mistaken and they're sharing it because of sincere belief usually, right? Because of a desire to inform their community. Um, and it implies that there is a known true and false um, element to what is happening. And I see the appeal, right? When again, back in 
2014, 2015, when I was looking at this, I, I don't, I don't know that there was really much of a vocabulary for it, right? You could say anti-vaccine propaganda, um, but a lot of it was, you know, and, and some of it was that, uh, or anti-vaccine conspiracy theories that, you know, imputed some ulterior motive, right? That alleged that a group of people were deliberately conspiring to conceal the truth about vaccines and autism. That's a separate class of thing. Um, but misinformation referred to stuff that was just kind of factually wrong. And when a lot of these conversations started to become national conversations, the term that they sort of rose to prominence with was the term fake news. And again, fake news, prior to it becoming sort of, again, a propagandistic term, it really referred to stories that were just not factually true, right? Pope endorses Donald Trump, Megyn Kelly fired from Fox News, or a bunch of these that, that would go viral. Um, and, and, you know, what was interesting about it was that they were misinformation. There was nothing wrong with the term as it applied to some of those things. Um, but what it missed was the motivation, was why people were doing this, because it it had become, particularly as, you know, um, as more and more people spend time on Twitter, as it becomes bigger, as it becomes really this opinion shaping machine over the years, um, a lot of what happens is that something goes viral before the truth can be known. So there were a lot of questions about um, how should social media platforms handle this, right? There was a question about Google News, for example, during mass shootings would almost would, would regularly get gamed by people who would share this meme of this guy named Sam Hyde, alleging that this sort of figure, uh, this sort of you know meme figure was the perpetrator. And so there were a lot of questions around like, how should platform like what should they curate what should they surface how could you get at a sense of the truth or of reality or of what was known and so that's where that you know misinformation it became pretty clear pretty quickly was you know, it was kind of a not exactly describing what was happening which was you know much much better described i think by the term rumors which people like kate starbert at university of washington were using um, information that just isn't clear in that moment in time. Propaganda was the term that I started harping on in part because I did so much work on state actors. So a huge amount of my work at SIO and um, you know even even since, honestly, in the last couple of months, state actors have been in the news again lately, uh, was looking at how do state actors like Russia or China or Iran use these networks to spread information. Again, the point is not the factuality of the information. The point is the power agenda underlying the information that's actually important. And so I wanted to get away from that term because I felt like it, it just wasn't, it was like a misdiagnosis of what people were there looking for, what the platforms were serving to them, how influencers, algorithms, and crowds interacted and around what. And, you know, other people disagree, um, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's that's where I kind of came down on it. Mm. Uh Oh, Eddie Bernays plays a big, big role when we're talking about uh, propaganda. Um, as a quick starting point, like an inside baseball starting point, did you ever talk to Adam Curtis at any point in this research process? I don't think so. No. Okay. Because I should I. Well, you know, um, he in in um, Century of the Self, he spends a lot of time um, talking about the role. Eddie Bernays has played um, in the in the development of the information ecosystem. There's a few. He's come up a lot more lately. I think uh, Annalie Newitz, um, mm. I hope I'm pronouncing their name right, uh, just wrote a book, Stories or Weapons. And and that also goes deep into Bernays and sort of his involvement with, um, you know, marketing campaigns that led to political uprisings and, you know, th things along this uh, along this axis. So it's it's been sort of encouraging to see now in 2024, um, some of what I think was neglected in the early conversations about fake news, misinformation, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, because it's happening on a new communication environment, I think there were a lot of new terms assigned or efforts to describe something as if it was a novel phenomenon. My own personal experience with that was because I didn't study this in college, <laughs> I actually, and I don't have a PhD, um, I actually wound up doing a, a whole bunch of reading on um, you know, historical reading to try to contextualize it for myself in in terms of uh, what had happened in other moments past. What what had you know? Whenever there's a big technological shift, there's sort of an accompanying 
uh, societal reordering, right, and, and communication technologies. And so I wanted to go back and look at those big pivotal moments who had benefited from them, how power had transitioned. And, and that for me was uh, part of what is in the book is, is trying to tell that story in a non-academic way so people don't feel overwhelmed by it, but understand in context what's happened. Totally. And to your credit, you do a wonderful job. <laughs> um, but yeah, who who is Eddie Bernays and what's his role in the not only the development of propaganda, but also, you know, coining the or writing the sort of definitive book on propaganda. Yeah, so he was a nephew of Sigmund Freud. Um, he worked as a propagandist um, during the the Creel Commission in World War One, and he has this um, this sort of epiphany as he's doing that um, that it is actually the obligation of the government to create propaganda. Um, and the argument that they make. So first of all, the term's not quite a pejorative at this point. All right, it, it's still sort of um, information that must be spread, information that you were sort of compelled to spread, um, but it's it, it doesn't really become a pejorative until after it becomes that thing that the Nazis are doing, right? Um, so at the time he's writing this book, he's making some connections between, um, he, he becomes known as the father of public relations because he's also sort of arguing about, not only is it the government's obligation to shape opinion, because he argues people don't have the time to go and figure out all of the facts for themselves. They're not going to become an expert in all of the many, many topics that are relevant to being a good citizen. Again, he's saying this in around 1929 or so. Uh, and so what you see is this, um, this argument that he makes, Walter Lippmann and a few other people make it around the same time, that it is in fact the, the obligation of the government to convey to the public the facts of the matter, right? Whatever the matter may be. And he then also begins to realize that a lot of how this works best is by appealing to people in their identity as members of a group. So he has this recognition that you then see other people who study propaganda kind of go on to echo and, you know, sort of like every 20 years or so, someone <laughs> argues the same point um, that making appeals to people in their capacity as group members is incredibly powerful. And that this is what he argues um, companies should be doing. If you want to sell cigarettes to women, then reframe them as something that, um, you know, modern, liberated women use, right? And then if you want to see yourself as a modern, liberated woman, there's an association that's made between how you want to see yourself or how you do see yourself and this particular product that can enhance your, you know, your uh, presence in that identity, I guess. And so he makes this connection also, he calls these people invisible rulers, the people who are responsible for actually creating this demand, creating this, uh, I, this sort of, um, this perception of identity and then the opinions and the products and the, in the he, go, he has a whole couple chapters on political beliefs that go along with that identity. And so I was very interested in looking at that, that question of the invisible ruler. What does that look like, you know, a century later, who are the people that are shaping your understanding of yourself as a member of a, of a group, who are the people that are then telling you as a member, as a good member of a group, this is what you believe and this is who you listen to and this is what you read, this is how you dress and the various aspects of, um, you know, both uh, marketing and political propaganda that, uh, that we're active today. Well, who are those people? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> for a while now, I've been writing this argument, and people can disagree, but but my argument is that propaganda itself was democratized along with, whenever you have the ability to communicate, whenever you have the ability to grow a large audience, um, things that were previously in the purview of mass media, right, um, then we should expect to see a shift in propaganda as well. Just as there are propagandistic elements in mass media and incentive structures that lead to the production of propaganda in mass media, the argument that I've made for the last five years or so is that that is also true in the social media ecosystem. You have people who have the reach of media, you have people who profit from that reach, who profit from that attention. And what we see when we talk about things like audience capture is, uh, which is when a, when an influencer will sometimes sort of move in the direction that their fandom wants them to go, they're responding to an incentive in order to keep making money from the influencer, in order to keep establishing them, sorry, in order to keep making money from the crowd, in order to maintain their position as a speaker for the crowd, you see them moving along um, with the crowd in some cases or responding to their audience's demands for, for more and more extreme content or more and more pointed content that makes some other group an enemy. 
And I wanted to write about those dynamics, the the incentives of how is your coverage, so to speak, or your commentary shaped by the people who pay your bills? How is the outputs where you're framing a group as some sort of other or some sort of enemy? Um, how does that relate to your financial incentives and the the reach that you have? And so I, I started writing essays actually about it first, just arguing that we had just had a, a shift in which there was the longstanding top-down propaganda of mass media, but there was also this new and novel form that social media had made possible. And I think that many people actually, as, as I get feedback on the book, many people will write to me and they say, I didn't realize how much money they actually made. I didn't realize how the money was made. I didn't realize you know, how this thing was monetized or why this person went in that direction. And so I really just kind of set out to do what um, I don't know, maybe it sounds arrogant, but, but what Chomsky did with manufacturing consent in 1980s, which is here is how this new system works. Here is how you should think about it. And here is how you can be a more informed consumer and understand why your favorite influencer is doing what they do through this understanding of what that influence ecosystem looks like. Mm. Could you quickly describe uh, Manufacturing Consent for folks who might not be familiar? Yeah. So Manufacturing Consent is a book written by um, Noam Chomsky and um, in, gosh, 1986. And, and what he writes in the book, it was in the 1980s, <laughs> what he writes in the book, uh, the first chapter is this, um, this examination of what he calls the five filters. So just ways in which uh, the broadcast media ecosystem, which again, in this, uh, in this age is pre-internet. So we're talking about television, radio, uh, print. Um, he's writing about the forces, the filters that go into media framing its coverage in particular ways or self-censoring in particular ways. So he describes things like, um, ownership of the media. Now, broadcast media requires a significant amount of money to own. And so he makes this argument that, Many of the owners of broadcast media also have vested interests in other industries, potentially leading their media properties not to cover those industries as uh, aggressively or, or clearly or fairly maybe as they should because of a conflict perceived by not wanting to, to piss off the owners. Um, advertisers provide the money for mass media. And when you have an advertising based business model, the media properties don't want to alienate the advertisers. So they might not cover, you know, if a pharmaceutical company is advertising, then the media property might not cover pharma quite so hard again, because they don't want them to say, well, we're going to pull our ads. Another kind of unintentional impact of advertising is that you have a um, particular audience that the advertiser wants to reach. So a pharmaceutical company might want to reach relatively well off, uh, you know, upper middle class people, which means that the content that the publication produces has to speak to that audience and maybe then chooses not to speak to lower income audiences or to tell the stories of interest to other communities. And so what Chomsky writes about in the book is his argument is not that mainstream media is bad and you should ignore it. It's that here is how you can more thoroughly understand the incentives of this system and how they lead to these outputs. And one of the other filters that I'll mention is um, he describes the need for media to turn, uh, to have a common enemy. And so in the age of broadcast media, it's sort of all of America, right? Speaking to a very broad, uh, sort of broad American audience uh, against uh, when he begins writing, it's the communists, right? So the communists. And then I think he wrote a, uh, he wrote an updated sort of forward to the book um, in which he describes uh, the sort of the terrorists, because he, I think he writes it after September 11th, and he's writing about the other in that case being this sort of, we've gone from communism to terrorism. And so by framing some people as bad as the enemy, media tells simple stories that people will quickly grok, but it, they're not necessarily uh, delving into the nuance uh, as they should be. Mm. So jumping back to influencers then, with mm -hmm. that context, you write about this uh, fictional character based on real world, uh, uh, sort of an amalgam of real world stories uh, of Guitar Guy. Um, could you could you chart us through how like Guitar Guy, like <laughs> what Guitar Guy's evolution on the internet uh, is and sort of what it tells us about how algorithms, crowds and influencers are, are entangled? The funny story about that passage, which I don't think I've said any, anywhere yet, is that... Um, I was 
I was talking to my agent as I was as I was writing the the proposal, right? And I and I said I want to write an update to manufacturing consent. I want to write a book about propaganda. And she was like, no, one, no one wants to read that, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I was like, well, no, I think, I think this, like this character of the influencer, right? This is, this is a character that is really unique to social media. This is something that didn't exist previously. It's like this fascinating sort of Pied Piper figure, but it's not as basic as Pied Piper. It's not just these like, you know, magical gurus who are leading the, the mindless masses through the wilderness. Like there's a real interplay there. And I, and I was trying to describe it. And she was like, well, you know, write me a story about it, right? Write me how it works. And so I literally was like, all right, how am I going to do this? Because I, you know, I am extremely online, but my, your average reader might not be. And so I'm like, I don't want to talk about the arc of a particular person because that's also limiting or is read as partisan or, or, or issue based or something. So I, I wrote the story of Guitar Guy, just trying to describe um, a, like a person who goes on social media to engage, right? To communicate, to be with friends, to find connections, to promote his, you know, his, his music, his band. Um, and then one day winds up uh, weighing in on the Eric, <laughs> this is right around the time of the Eric Clapton vaccine controversy, right? Uh, during COVID. And, you know, and and what, one thing that we saw as, as I was looking at, at the sort of intersection of influencers and COVID was that influencers who had never weighed in on anything remotely related to public health or vaccines or anything else, all of a sudden had opinions, right? And and those opinions got a lot of engagement. And once people get a lot of engagement, they say, hey, this is actually fantastic for me. I'm going to keep talking about this topic. And then you see the relationship. You know, you can read it in the YouTube chat sometimes. You can see it on Twitter where there people are saying, you know what you really need to look at, man? You need to look at this other thing over here, right? And you see that progression depending on, you know, how the how, how credulous or how compelling the influencer finds it, then they'll start talking about that. Hey, you know, I was on, somebody sent me this thing and I was reading it and let me just talk to you about it. You know, I'm just asking questions over here, you know, and you see them sort of move in this direction. They get feedback, their audience begins to grow, they get more engagement. And so I wanted to tell the story of that, that kind of audience capture thing that happens. And I actually, um, I actually didn't even plan on incur like including that in the book. That was, <laughs> that's my one-on-one attempt at, at, a, at an explanation. But then um, people seem to find it helpful. It's always interesting to me sometimes to see um, what, you know, what kind of stories or examples are um, resonate with people. But I, I just wanted to tell the story of how, how that feedback loop actually functions and, you know, where the, where the motivation comes from, where the potentially quite well-meaning, um, you know, journeys down the rabbit hole sometimes begin. Right. It also reveals the, um, what is it? The 99, one rule. Yeah. That most people, so 99, um, what is it? 99, no, nine, 90 slash nine slash one is, um, how sometimes it depends on the platform, but it's this idea that, um, 90% of people are lurkers, 9% will engage in some way. And 1% sort of shape the entire zeitgeist of the platform by being frequent posters or influential posters. Um, and it's very interesting to see how that happens. Um, I was on Blue Sky last night and they just hit 10 million users. And um, as part of hitting 10 million users, they gave this little, wid this little widget you could click on your profile on the desktop and you could see your user number. Um, and then what percentage of the, <laughs> of the joining sort of phase you were in. And it was sort of interesting to see people posting, you know, I was, I was seeing a lot of people who I think are influencers on the platform now. And you see like who came in at the 0.1% mark, who came in at the 1% mark, who was a 10 percenter and, you know, and, um, and just also seeing, you know, just because you're an early adopter doesn't mean you're highly influential or have a highly engaged following. So there's this component of being in the right place at the right time, knowing how to use the platform, developing relationships, having other people who amplify you and just sort of watching that dynamic, um, watching that dynamic evolve on Blue Sky. It's been very interesting because it is a fairly transparent, very new platform. You can actually see it happening from the ground up. Totally. And there's also, of course, um, I mean, this episode will probably come out a little bit after this is maybe like uh, a white hot news item, but um, all the Brazilian Twitter, not yeah, all the Brazilian yeah, Twitter, yeah, but yeah. so many Brazilian Twitter users have come over and Blue Sky implemented um, video. So there's mm -hmm. been this kind of confluence of energy um, that nobody could have 
necessarily planned for, or I, I assume not, maybe, maybe people had inside knowledge of, of uh, Brazilian politics. Um, but what's your take on what's happening at Blue Sky um, and at relative to Twitter? It's an election year. There's just mm -hmm. a lot of kind of divergent forces. Like what's your, what's your finger to the wind on all this? Yeah, it's interesting times, right? So there had been, I call it like the great decentralization. And I, I keep meaning to write something about this. Like the, <laughs> the it's hard to write about because it's like something that interests me, but I don't know if it interests more than like 20 people. But the in 2018 or so, you started to see right-wing audiences looking for alternative platforms. The original rise of the alt platform, like diaspora, if you will, is right-wing users going to Gab, to Parler, to Getter. And then uh, in 2021, Trump starts Truth Social. And so you see people who are who feel alienated by you know Twitter 1.0's kind of moderation frameworks uh, going and migrating to other places, but they're not particularly sticky. And this is sort of an interesting thing because one of the things that we see as you know, my uh, former team at SIO would write up analyses of you know, of all these different platforms, you can go read them, just describing like activity levels, what people are doing there. You do see um, what we call the emoji and bio signal, which is people who come from, let's say Brazil, but on, uh, I think it was parlor maybe that was Saudi Arabia, huge influx of Saudi users. Sometimes when a government acts as if it might limit access to a platform, users will preemptively go and establish themselves on a new platform. And you can sort of tell this is happening because of an increase in posts in a particular language or the increased presence of people will put their emoji flag in their bio. This is very common in Brazil. It was very common in Saudi Arabia also. So you can actually see how real world, either regulatory events or a government cracking down or political unrest actually makes people migrate to particular platforms. And in 2022, after Elon Musk bought Twitter, so Blue Sky had already been established, but as an internal project within Twitter. So it sort of spins out, raises some money, and its uh, audience growth process is uh, invites, is invite codes. And, you know, I was an early user. I'm in the 0.1%. <laughs> um, you would get these, like, I think I had like 30 of them or something, right? Um, and so you would you'd be able to, like, send your invite codes out to friends. This was very interesting, though, because it does lead to particular establishment of networked communities reestablishing themselves on a different platform. This is useful for network effects for the platform, because if I as let's say a center left liberal go over there and find nobody to talk to, then I might not be inclined to stay. But if I'm giving 30, if I'm given 30 invites and I can bring my 30 closest friends and then they in turn bring theirs and so on and so forth, um, you do see the establishment of communities in that networked way. So the same way that you saw this right-leaning exodus uh, earlier to right-leaning alt platforms, that's what you do see happen on Blue Sky on the left, uh, particularly the progressive left. And then Threads, uh, Meta enters the market maybe a year ago, if I'm remembering correctly. I think it was like, I think it's just about a year old now. Um, and they try to build, they try to piggyback on Instagram social graph, right? So again, they have this like, your Threads account is kind of tied to your Instagram account. And then you can, um, there's a sense that you then have a community established when you get there. So you do see the later entrants appealing to people who are kind of fleeing a different platform and again because of moderation shifts and so there's that incentives you know there again the incentives kind of like are always in play but you see people establishing themselves on different communities so now moving into 2024 instead of four years ago where it was sort of the the big three platforms and then these sort of tiny alt ecosystems that never really took off on the right you have much more of a um of a decentralized environment mastodon is is the other that um, that I forgot to mention that's also very much in there even prior to Blue Sky with the sort of first wave of people who left Twitter. So it's just an interesting um, communities reestablishing themselves in preferred environments. I don't think it's necessarily good. Like I like that there's more market options, but I do think it's not great that we're all sort of fleeing to our own independent silos and uh, <laughs> and and uh, and forming very insular networks within them. Totally, and also the fact that like the planes are being built as they're taking off. Like even you brought up threads, like the fact that, you know, after hoovering up a bunch of users and, and sort of like not, not painting the tape, but kind of fudging the numbers a little bit by just kind of like incidentally, like getting Instagram users into, into threads. Like after all that has happened, they're like, 
by the way, we're de-emphasizing political content, which is sort of a lifeblood <laughs> of, a, of a timeline feed. Um, and then meanwhile, like Blue Sky recently rolled out, um, like prior to the video rollout, rolled out DMs, which I have yeah. to be honest, like I, I was pretty active on Twitter, like in 2020, 2021. And I think I like got like truly burned out on it. And so I, I don't really participate very much on timeline feeds anymore, just because of, of many of the things you outlined in the book. But um, I sort of lurk on blue sky intermittently. And so I kind of catch these moments where there's, where there's new feature sets, but it's like a weird dynamic where say what we will about Twitter and sort of like a monolithic timeline app. It was mostly built out and was also building out, you know, obviously trust and safety teams. Like there was the secondary important scaffolding that could be built out. Whereas a lot of these platforms are like primary decisions and primary aspects of them are being implemented in real time yep. that I think radically change how people participate on them. Yeah. And people have um, deep opinions about content moderation. So in the early days of Blue Sky, so Blue Sky, um, just for people who are not totally aware, Blue, Blue Sky is uh, intended to be a federated platform. It's, in, it's based on a protocol, which means that people will eventually sort of run their own instances, much the way um, Mastodon operates in the Fediverse. So if you join Mastodon, you join a server, and then your experience of Mastodon is partially shaped by the community moderation rules and norms that your server instance administrator runs. For people who are not used to this, you might think about it as like you go and you join a subreddit on Reddit, and like there is some top level moderation somewhere that says, you know, um, child exploitation content is illegal, illegal content is illegal, you know, that just sort of has these very, very top level things. But then whatever the rules are in your subreddit are largely shaped by whoever the mods are in the subreddit. And so you do see people like working the refs, right? No mod. <laughs> that shouldn't be like taken down or screaming for the mods when they think something should be, right? And Blue Sky is interesting because, and, and so is Mastodon, because it is this idea that you'll be able to devolve that control down. But what we saw on Blue Sky as it began is that people who were leaving Twitter, when you first go to a new community and everybody's like you, right? And, and they've come in through the invites and there's a small niche group of people. A lot of times you don't really need the moderation right away. Everybody's sort of reasonably all on the same page. But what you do start to see is these little fights about moderation that start to happen on Blue Sky because Blue Sky didn't have people dedicated to this as they were building Blue Sky. And so there's a bunch of these, um, kind of fights that begin to happen where some members of the community get very, very, very angry that the platform is not moderating the way that they think it should. And it doesn't yet have these subscribable or what are sometimes called composable moderation feeds where you can actually subscribe to a third party moderation framework that moderates in a way that you are ideologically or values based alignment with and then your content is filtered according to what you've chosen to subscribe to. Sometimes this is called middleware, right? You, you choose to subscribe to a third party actor's vision for how to curate your feed. And you can see this on Blue Sky by subscribing to certain labeling entities where let's say you care a lot about like ableism or something and you want to see all posts that are using ableist language you want filtered out of your feed. You don't want to see that kind of stuff. That's the sort of thing where you can subscribe to a service that you know ingests Blue Sky and does those labels, and then that is then filtered out of your feed. And maybe somebody else doesn't care about ableism, but you know doesn't want to see hate speech or something along those lines. So there's a lot of um, potential for much more granular dynamics when you have those um, those sort of composable or subscribable feeds, but you're also really sort of putting your trust in whoever that labeler is. And you also see sort of, you know, hilarity ensues as some of the discord servers leak where these moderators, these sort of blue sky labelers are acting. And you see some of the conversations where they look like they're, you know, trying to find a justification to put the label mm. that they want to put on. And this is where you get at, again, the problem of social media content moderation is a human problem, not just a technological problem. And you really see that play out. So I've been, um, you know, just as a person who studies social media and trust and safety frameworks, kind of fascinated by watching the growing pains of, uh, of composable moderation on some of the uh, some of the federated platforms. Because the contrast is threads, which is just like, this is what we're doing. We don't like political content. There you go. You know, <laughs> take it yeah. or leave it, right? Yeah. Um, and... 
and you know, and you you see the user base kind of lobbying back, right? You know, there were like people are tagging uh, Mosseri constantly, like. Um, we want more political content. Why did you hide this button? Why did you hide this? Like, uh, you know, because there were some like defaults matter. And I think that at one point they shifted the default for political content to off rather than on. Right. And then there were all these posts that were going viral, teaching people how to go and turn it on. So, yeah, totally, totally. Um, yeah. And they're also trying to have their cake and eat it too with like pro fediverse but also we have like major top-down control but anyway not to be not to stay too inside, <laughs> inside baseball on, no on i think the, like the inside baseball stuff it's actually like i think it's actually important i mean i know mm. that um because everybody has an opinion about how moderation shouldn't be done but when mm. you ask them what do you want to see instead what is your ideal state what what is the universe you want um things get very, very, very hand wavy very quickly, right? I just mm -hmm. don't want to see the stuff I don't like. I, I don't want to see the bad stuff. And then, I, so I think it is actually important when you have conversations about social media or content moderation um, to really make people think about what is it you want? Like, how, and how would you actually do it? And who do you put in charge and how? So totally, totally. I mean, for my money, I think Elon Musk is a great, great leader. Um, <laughs> But actually, on that note, you brought up work in the refs, and I feel like there's a couple really good work in the refs anecdotes in um, Invisible Rulers. One involving Elon Musk, Matt Taibbi, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Michael Schellenberger, um, and then also the way that that cascades into your your brush with the inimitable Jim Jordan. Um, <laughs> so I'd, I'd love to invite you to share if we could if we could uh, sort of shift gears a little bit, share mm -hmm. kind of what happened there. Yeah. So, you know, I'd written about content moderation and, you know, how I thought it should be done, right? Here, here's Renee's opinion since 2015, 2016 or so. And, um, you know, and and when the uh, Twitter files began, uh, which is around December of 2022, I actually thought, and I wrote this in Wired so everybody can go read it, um, that it actually had potential. Right. I thought like, OK, so we'll get some interesting studies into content moderation, all of these things that we can't see. Even me as a, as a, as a researcher who has, you know, communication relationships with tech platforms at times, I don't I don't have visibility into their internal decision making processes. I only know when I engage with them on something, I can see did they respond and what did they do? And I, I that's that's really the, the sort of limits um, unless there's some sort of policy exchange in an academic seminar or something. Um, so I thought, okay, well now we're going to see all the interesting stuff. And then that wasn't what happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, and I really mean it when I say like, I think it was a missed opportunity. I think it was a missed opportunity to have at least some people in there who were both independent journalists and understood content moderation. Um, people like Mike Masnick, for example, at TechDirt, because when you're given access to look at moderation decisions, you can sort of do what these, these sort of like writers did where you go and you pick your pet topic, right? How was the Hunter Biden laptop censored? How was the FBI colluding to suppress whatever, you know, did, I mean, the, Schellenberger wrote this whole thing about like the FBI was paying Twitter to censor, just absolutely ludicrous take there. Uh, it was, that was how Elon Musk, uh, expressed it. You know, this was, um, when, a um, when a government agency requests that a platform do something, they pay them for their time. And so so there were, you know, payments from the FBI to Twitter, which were then recast as like the FBI paid Twitter to censor speech it didn't like. This was the sort of argument that came out. Again, people who actually understand the legality of those situations came out and tried to clarify and to say, no, 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 that's not what happened at all. But they get a thousand retweets and then Elon Musk boosts this take over here that the FBI is paying Twitter to censor people and that gets, you know, 20 million views. Right. And, and so um, so, you, you, you know, you see <laughs> the sort of incentivized dynamics in play here and then very little is done to look at a systemic level. Right. When we say um, these five accounts have some sort of content trends ban. OK, that's an interesting signal. What other accounts? are in the content trends ban. How many accounts are, are they distributed by topic? Like, what can we say? You know, when you have access to the entirety of the platform, like, my God, ask bigger questions, you know, make them give you something that's like summary stats, get, get at real transparency, not at just, we're going to tell some story based on our opinion of this kind of cherry picked thing that uh, this, this sort of grievance that, uh, that our readers want to read about. So, you know, so I wrote about that. And, um, and then I get, I get this, uh, 
funny inquiry from Tybee in what been like maybe March time frame. And it what did he even ask me? He was writing about like Hamilton 68 or something, which I had nothing to do with. But I got this inquiry that was like, I need you to comment on two things. One, you used to work for the CIA. Two, and I'm trying to remember what the hell the second one was. Um, I don't, I honestly don't even remember, but they were like two statements of fact. And I thought like, this is, this is, it's, it's I remember probably, what it was. Do you remember? It, what was it? <laughs> it was, it was, it was a former boss saying you were not Oh qualified. my God. Yeah. Yes. It was, it wasn't a former boss. It was, um, it was one of the heads of policy at Twitter. Uh, I remember this now. Thank you. I've gotten so many stupid media inquiries. It's hard to keep them straight. But <laughs> <laughs> in this one, yes, those were the two things. That was the other thing he complained about. And it was because he had an email from like 2015 when again, I wasn't, I wasn't in academia yet. I was still very much like, you know, an activist writing about this stuff. It was like 2015, 2016, maybe, maybe even, no, you know, it, was, it probably would have been about 2017. Cause I was like kind of lobbying Congress to request data on the Russian uh, Twitter kind of assets, you know, the, the, uh, the Russian social media troll factory, like kind of, they were supposed to provide data to the Senate intelligence committee. And I was sort of arguing for what should be in there. Um, and yes, at the time, I had a very acrimonious relationship with these platforms. I was regularly writing op-eds and, you know, <laughs> beating a drum for who any, anybody who would listen that maybe they should be regulated and maybe they should be turning over their data and so on and so forth. And so the fact that they didn't like me internally was like the least surprising thing ever. Um, I also really didn't care because, again, it was like four years prior. Like, what am I going to, I'm not going to lose sleep over somebody in a company I'm yelling at, being mad at me in an email internal to the company. But but when I got that email, I just thought like, okay, this is going to be a smear, right? There is, there, you know, explain to me why this person thinks you're an idiot and also you work for the CIA. And I was like, okay, I know where this is going. Um, <laughs> and that's exactly where it went, right? There's, again, nothing surprising about, about that interaction. Um, I regularly post bad media inquiries I get now. I, I have um, become much more proactive about screenshotting the emails and dropping them on the internet along with my response so people can see exactly how that sausage is made. But what winds up happening in this case is that Tybee is then invited to testify, and so is Michael Schellenberger, by Jim Jordan in a Twitter files hearing uh, in, um, I believe it was like late March or so, of uh, or maybe mid-March of, of 2023. And in that hearing, they just sort of, they just sort of start spouting off all of these theories about our work, about our work studying election rumors, our work studying, um, your work at Stanford rumors, Internet Observatory. my work at Stanford Internet Observatory, but no, they, they extend it past there, right? They try to present me as this like Russiagate hoaxer, because again, I did work evaluating a data set for the Senate Intelligence Committee with demonstrable attributed Russian activity. I didn't say it swung the election. I didn't say Trump knew anything about it. But when people try to smear you, they just grab all of these different things that they can do, all these little bits of evidence for why you're bad or why you're evil or you're a leftist or you're a Democrat or you know, you're know you unqualified, you, know, you name it. The attacks just layer on as much as they can. And so that's what happened there too. They said I had undisclosed ties to the CIA by which they meant my college internship. Their evidence was that my college internship was not on my LinkedIn, which yes, at 42 years old, it is not, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, they just sort of like layered it on thick. But what wound up happening was that as they sit there and they testify about these things under oath in a Senate hearing, they're not articulating things that they found in Twitter's emails, they begin to draw on supplementary material from crazy right-wing blogs. And I mean, when I say that, I don't mean like marginally conservative partisan blogs or even explicitly conservative partisan blogs. I mean, conspiracy theorist blogs that say things like Stanford censored 22 million tweets. Duresta had access to had, what oh my God, what was it? FBI level access to Twitter's internal systems, which are words that mean nothing and also are not true. Um, and again, this, this layering on of allegations expressed under oath in a congressional hearing then lead to, for us, about a day, two days later, a letter from Jordan saying these allegations were made and I take them very seriously. And in my capacity and oversight, I'm going to be overseeing them. You know, I'm going to be digging. And, and this demands then all of our emails uh, with platforms and with the executive branch of the government. And, uh, you know, yeah, and then that process begins. Um, and they decide that we're not responding quickly enough. So they, you know, Jordan posts a very 
uh, you know, aggressive letter to Stanford uh, subpoena subpoenas us uh, post that to Twitter. Cause again, most of this is being done to appeal to the base. This is not a committee that's doing any actual oversight or that actually cares about what we did or didn't do or said or didn't say. It's just, you know, it's sort of uh, at this point comes very clear, very quickly that this is a performative exercise in adjudicating grievances um, that are, you know, the Twitter files have made clear are very, very interesting. Um, you know, to, to Jordan's base. So that's, mm. I feel like I've kind of gone on about that long enough, but if you have specific questions, I'm happy to <laughs> to take them. Uh, yeah, I definitely do. But before that, I realized there's a little bit of groundwork to set, which is what, what is we actually do? was the Stanford Internet Observatory, the virality project, like the integrity <laughs> project, like what's that arc of stuff that they're, that they're uh, coming at you for? Yeah, so SIO is was is I don't, I don't even know at this it point. Is it, what's the I, what's you the know status? they sort of like um, most people's contracts were not renewed in June of 2024, including mine. Uh, there's a couple people, two people maybe still there, um, and the center was uh, oriented to focus exclusively on child safety, basically. So let me explain what that means. So SIO, when it was established in 2019. Um, was established as a center within Stanford Cyber Policy Center, and it was tasked with studying abuse uh, of you know, abuse on the internet, abuse of, of online systems. I usually say adversarial abuse. There was like somebody somewhere who was attempting to do some sort of manipulative thing, and so in that framing, what that meant most of the time was that we were looking at things like spammers and scammers. We were looking at child exploitation content. Huge amount of our work actually focused on uh, on, on child safety. Um, we looked at various other trust and safety things, teen mental health, people seeing pro anorexia content. Um, we looked at, you know, sort of bucket two was the disinformation work, if you will, that was overwhelmingly focused on state actors. There are just dozens and dozens of reports that we put up over the years looking at Russia, Iran, China, and actually even the US Pentagon, right? Just describing how state actors run influence operations. That was a lot of, a lot of my work focused on that. Um, Bucket three was emerging technology. So if you see adversarial manipulation as something that, um, you know, people are given specific affordances, there are particular algorithms they can attempt to manipulate. There's like a playing field, if you will. When you have a new technology or a new platform, that playing field shifts, they're able to do more things. Generative AI is kind of an obvious one, right? Now, not only can you spread, um, you know, viral edited videos, but you can also create the videos out of whole cloth yourself if you want to, right? So we looked at, honestly, the most impactful issue there is what happens when you have child exploitation content that is generated. And so a lot of our work over the last year has focused on that question, that intersection. So, and then the last bucket was policy, which is, since it's in a cyber policy center, um, part of our, you know, part of our role was to make recommendations, public recommendations uh, to platforms, to government. Uh, you know, we filed public comment whenever there would be, a, you know, an oversight board, Facebook oversight board or a European uh, DSA Article 40, the researcher data access provision, just these sort of obscure regulatory things that called for comment, we would submit public comment. Uh, and that was our work. And every now and then we would do some sort of interdisciplinary project. And there were, uh, you know, two of them. Basically, there was the Election Integrity Partnership, which operated in 2020 and then in 2022. That studied election rumors. And that was very narrowly scoped to look at rumors about the procedures and processes of elections. So people saying vote on Wednesday, not on Tuesday, or pretending to be poll workers, or um, you know, giving text to vote kind of information, the sorts of manipulation that you saw in 2016, sort of looking for what that looked like in 2020. And then the other big area was delegitimization, people alleging that the election was not free and fair, and making arguments about, um, you know, claiming that they had evidence that the election was not free and fair and putting this, these sorts of claims out there. The reason that we looked at delegitimization, and in 2022, we added on threats to election workers, is that these types of content can lead to, and in fact, in 2020 did lead to political violence. And so the, keep in mind that platform policies are not written for American elections. They are written for elections writ large at a global scale. And so when we looked at 
content in the context of the American election that appeared to violate their policies, we would occasionally tag them in. So we would occasionally say, you know, I think there were 4,000 4, or so URLs in total. Hey, you know, over the course of August to late November, um, this looks like it violates your policy, right? And so that was the sort of engagement that we would have with the platforms. In uh, 2021, we did a similar multi-institution research analysis of vaccine narratives. That was a little bit different. That one was really just to try to track what the most viral narratives of the week were. We posted them to our website in PDF form so anybody could go look at them. And we sent them out as briefings to anybody who signed up for our mailing list, which did include government agencies like the CDC, HHS, Office of the Surgeon General. So we were essentially doing research, doing academic research in these narrowly scoped, clearly defined areas. And then we were communicating uh, to the public and sometimes to the platforms um, and sometimes to, you know, to with, uh, you know, via these briefings, um, transmitting information to people who we saw as best equipped to counter speak, right? Who is going to get the accurate information out there? We talked about rumors a little earlier. So, you know, the facts aren't yet known about whether Sharpie markers are misreading ballots. We can't answer that, but an election official can. So that's where we saw our role as saying, hey, this is a big thing. Somebody should probably respond to that or to a platform. Hey, this is a big thing. This is alleging that the election is being stolen by virtue of Sharpie markers not reading certain people's ballots. This seems to violate your policies you know, do your thing with it. And that mm. was, that was the work. And so the allegation that was made was that we were some vast government funded government controlled censorship operation and, you know, the FBI and the CIA and DHS and all these other entities were sending us things to, to demand that platforms take down so that they essentially, they wanted content taken down and they were sending them to us and we were sending them to the platforms. And that's just not true. You know, we wrote it up in so many fact checks at this point. I kind of go into it in the book also just, you know, but again, one of the things that happens is like the rumors out there and it politically advantages Jim Jordan with his base. And so he, you know, launched an entire investigation and got all of our emails. And, you know, that was the, uh, the pretext under which this was launched. And when mm. they don't find the evidence they want, they move the goalposts and accuse you of something else. Right. Mm. And that's the, the sort of, um, kind of exhaustive, uh, <laughs> process that, that we've sort of experienced over the last, um, year and a half now. Mm. Yeah, you write about um, job owning and mm -hmm. just the essentially the weaponization of the levers of government, ironically, under the guise of free speech, like the work you're doing, yeah. is creating transparency. Yeah. Well, job owning is a real problem, right? Job owning is something that we as Americans. So for those who don't know, job owning uh, is a is 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 coercive speech by the government, in which the government makes a private actor, in this case, a social media platform take an action that it didn't want to do, but it is coerced into doing under something like a credible threat of regulation. So that is, uh, that is job owning. Job owning is bad, right? <laughs> job owning, funny enough, we have written about this too, right? Job owning is unambiguously bad, not something we should want to happen. Um, but in the facts of the specific case that, uh, that, that emerges, it's called Murphy v. Missouri. Um, this same, group of people. So, you know, Jim Jordan voted not to certify the 2020 election. These two attorneys general who bring this case, Louisiana and Missouri, also attempted to, uh, to, to prevent the certification of the 2020 election by filing amicus briefs with the attorney general of Texas trying to overturn the vote in Pennsylvania, right? So you have many people who are all ideologically aligned and really sort of unified around this idea that the 2020 election was stolen, going after the people who did the studies showing that the 2020 election, you know, showing how the narrative of the steal was formed, showing how that piece of political propaganda took hold in the American psyche. And so in a way, it's a retaliation, actually, against our First Amendment protected speech. We are private actors. We are not the government. We, if, if we communicate with the platforms, that is one private actor speaking to another. Again, there is no government nexus there. But you see them try to come up with these convoluted mechanisms for 
bringing the government into it. And this is actually why this theory that I have undisclosed ties to the CIA is in service to that. Because if I am a secret CIA agent and or the, you know, at one point they say like the CIA placed me in my role at Stanford, which is surreal. Like the agency waited 20 years <laughs> after <laughs> I left, you know, and I left at a time before Twitter existed, yet they somehow knew that like I would be useful for this top secret mission somewhere down the line. I mean, these are the things that you're being asked to believe when you think about them for 30 seconds. They, they, they beggar belief, right? They defy common sense. Yet, you know, this idea of like, no, there's got to be a government nexus in there somewhere. So then they allege that we're funded by the government, but that wasn't true. We didn't get a government grant uh, until late 2021, which was dispersed in 2022. So after this work had been done, you know, but but again, this this need to create some sort of conspiracy theory because they then the reason they're doing that is because they didn't actually have clear enough evidence that actual government job owning had occurred. So because the case was weak and Supreme Court winds up throwing it out for standing, but because the case was weak, the um, they they tried to come up with mechanisms by which the job owning might have happened. And so we get sucked into that sort of circumstantial uh, set of claims. Again, there is no evidence, nothing that we, you know, when we, when we turned over all of our material and emails and everything else to Jordan, there were no emails in there in which a government actor is telling us you need to take a tell a platform to take this down. So there is no evidence. And, and yet this rumor continues to persist because it's politically advantageous for the people who tried to overturn the 2020 election. Mm. And of course we can't, I mean, perhaps you do. From the outside, we can't know the motivation for not renewing all of your contracts, but we can maybe infer that this barrage of paperwork uh, had something to do with it. And it's so, very expensive. Well, I'll just yeah. I'll, I'll clarify on that. Look, it's um, in addition to the congressional subpoenas, uh, two different groups sued us. One of mm -hmm. them is Stephen Miller's America First Legal, um, and so that group again, led by an incentivized actor who wanted to overturn the 2020 election. Um, material that we turned over to Jordan's committee somehow found its way into that law firm's hands. And that law firm cited both closed door testimony and material emails turned over under subpoena to a congressional committee when it wrote amicus briefs for that congressional committee in the Murthy case. So again, even as we're being accused of some sort of intertwinement and collusion, exactly. This is the, for people who can't see your hand gesture. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> it's like the projection committee, um, and, that's, <laughs> and that's the and that's the um, that's the unfortunately like the, the the truth of the matter, right? And and so um, so this one thing that is interesting, and I can't even comment on the pending litigation because you are not supposed to comment on pending litigation when you're sued. Um, that issue, though, is extraordinarily expensive. It is time consuming. In addition to being expensive and time consuming, what you do see happen with the congressional subpoenas, I think this is really important to emphasize, is that some of the congressmen who sent them, it wasn't just Jim Jordan, it was uh, Dan Bishop over on the Homeland Security Committee, begin to request closed door interviews with undergraduate students, right? And so I don't know if the internet has ever been mad at you, but these emails sent by students on a student-run research project or their commentary and uh, you know, tickets discussing the rumors that they were looking at. Um, look, like when your email leaks or when your name comes out and the and a sitting American congressman is framing you as some sort of censor, you get a lot of death threats, it turns out, right? And this is, in my opinion, not something that, uh, you know, 20 to 22 year olds should be exposed to, or, you know, particularly when they were just doing good First Amendment protected research as, as undergraduate uh, teammates on a, um, you know, on a project. And so that, I think, is also a a, a, a big, um, it creates a lot of fear for a university that its students could be targeted this way. Staff, you know, I mean, <laughs> we are what we are, right? We're, we're, we're <laughs> we um, understand what, you know, you, you understand the, the, um, how these things, how these things play out and you've chosen to kind of take that risk. But, uh, but for students, it's a, it's a different, different dynamic. And so ultimately the university uh, made the decision to, um, you know, to, to sort of cut funding and uh, to stop doing rapid response election research projects. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not fair to interview, but it's particularly unfair to, to young folks um, who are just 
doing their doing their work in college. It brings me to the idea that you get at in the book of how um, organizations, companies, brands, like these more collective units should be thinking about their orientation to the social media sphere and to influence. Mm -hmm. um, you, you spend some time in the last chapter talking, like being very clear that these are hard, thorny, messy problems and yeah. there's not like some easy magic wand, but that there are things you can be doing both in advance of some type of, you know, bad act, bad action against you, but also what you can do kind of as it's happening and how you address rumors and so on and so forth. So I'd love to invite you to, to speak to some of that. Yeah, that was a really interesting, you know, it was an interesting experience for me because in the election project and in the vaccine project, one of the things that we saw ourselves doing was helping the counter speakers understand what to counter speak about. So again, the election official who actually understands how the Sharpie markers works needs to be the person putting out the information in that moment. And in the case of like some COVID vaccine side effects, like we're not physicians, we don't know, but some doctor out there can contextualize this and say, actually, this is happening in X percent of cases. Here's what happens. You know, here's how you should think about this. Just to kind of add that, add that clarity. So we had spent a lot of time in our writing, ironically, describing the need for these officials and institutions to counterspeak, to not sort of cede the ground to the rumor, but rather, you know, not let it like ossify, but, but get that information out there. And then when it came for us, we didn't do that. And the, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, Stanford really didn't want to say anything at all. And uh, Kate's team, my colleague Kate Starbert at U University of Washington, um, you know, she's she tenured faculty. She had <laughs> the the power to you know to sort of set up her uh, her her comm shop as, uh, as as she saw fit to describe her work, um, and they participated much more directly in the conversation regarding like countering the rumors and things like this. So, my frustration about this in part is because. Um, if you're if you're not communicating, then one of the things that happens, and brands really need to understand this, is once that rumor goes up, it becomes canon in some sort of you know media universe. I'm dealing with this now. You know, the Spectator, this British pub, wrote this. Uh, they they reached out to me for comment on a completely different topic uh, related to left wing misinformation. I gave a you know a I thought relatively neutral answer, you know, gave it to the reporter. And then the reporter smeared me in their piece. And again, with this like, um, you know, alleging in the piece. So first saying that I had downplayed this thing that she was upset about. I didn't think I did. Um, she sort of selectively quoted me. And then she wrote a whole second paragraph about how, um, how Matt Tybee had exposed that my team was behind, you know, ha had been involved in the censorship of the Hunter Biden laptop. Not true. We had nothing to do with it. And the lab leak. Not true. We had nothing to do with it. Um, and, you know, these are the sorts of moments where I demanded a correction. They haven't emailed me back. It's been uh, four days now. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to see that correction. But what a lot of the, what they do a lot of the time is once that lie, because it's a lie, is in a publication like that, the next publication will cite it. And so if they don't put the fact check in, if they don't put the correction in, if they blow me off, which it looks like is what they plan to do, then the next publication can just cite it and they can say, well, as the spectator reported, or in this case, the spectator can just say like, well, we Googled you and this is what came up because, you know, this nutcase blog over here said it. And that's the thing that brands need to understand. And if you're not actually out there, like these things do have a cumulative effect. And so within this particular media universe, it's going to be, or it already is, common knowledge that my team somehow did something to Hunter Biden's laptop, which again, completely not true. We did nothing. It wasn't even in scope for us. Or the lab leak hypothesis, which again, if anything, we argued that this was a bad moderation policy and one that that didn't connect in the same way to the values that were underlying a lot of the other COVID moderation policies. So mm -hmm. it's a very frustrating experience. I know that was a long answer, but that that building up of lore within a community eventually becomes something that is like essentially impossible to refute. And in the book, I, I draw the connection back to like Procter and Gamble in the 1980s trying to counter a rumor that it was somehow like that its logo was Satanist 
and that it was somehow, you know, this was during the satanic panics of the, you know, the eighties, um, this argument that, that Procter and Gamble was, was somehow a Satanist and they had to like enlist all these people to speak on their behalf. And eventually the rumor winds up getting stamped out a bit when they start suing their competitors who are saying it. And that's sort of an interesting dynamic there too, which is, is counter speech enough or does it have to be litigated through the courts at some point? And that's a very frustrating thing if you believe in free speech and counter speech and the idea that uh, that you should be able to correct the record by by putting your facts out there. So totally, totally. As as a journalist, whenever I know people who are going on the record with journalists, I always tell them counter requests to record the interview as well. Yeah. Um, just because like you, you maybe you won't even do anything with it, but just the social conditioning just of to have it. Else knowing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what I did in this case, um, because like I like I alluded to, this is this is now how I how I do it is I screenshotted all the emails and I dumped them on threads. And I was like, here, like at least, you know, it, it's frustrating because what I need to do now is like write up a post that has those emails so that at least if you search, that'll come up. But this is so time consuming. It's so time totally. consuming and it's so stupid, right? Like <laughs> just be normal. You know, <laughs> it's not that hard. And it's very frustrating that the, this, this, that, that the burden of dealing with this bullshit, um, you know, because it falls on me in this case, if I actually want to get that out there, otherwise I just throw up my hands and say like, okay, there's nothing I can do about it. So why even bother? Yeah. And I, and I really don't know what the answer is. I feel like that'll be like book two actually will be like a deep dive on, you know, when you've been smeared, like, what efforts actually work because I, I think that this is such an unwritten rule book now you know stanford's say nothing do nothing policy that's crisis comms 101 from like the 1990s right just let right. the media the media cycle will change and then you try to explain like there's no such thing as a media cycle anymore that's that's not what's happening here right mainstream media won't even bother with this but this this like alternate universe over here is going to dredge us up every single chance it gets to continue to sell subs and you know push controversy and once you're a character in that cinematic universe the, the the mainstream media cycle is entirely like off to the side. It's not even it's not even in the same space. And totally. that I think has been a thing that companies don't necessarily like. They haven't really internalized it. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, not especially companies, but even individuals. Um, like even yourself, I, I also spoke to Nina Jankowitz about what she went through, and um, yeah, a lot of the older ideas about you know don't say anything, let it pass. You know, you know when you know when they go low, we go high. All of that, like there is tr there are kernels of truth in that still. Mm -hmm. um, and like you reference the media cycle, there is no singular media cycle, but there's plenty of like these like hyper these yeah, like, it's like little mushrooms everywhere. Style. Yeah, <laughs> and so there are things we're learning in real time, but we don't necessarily have um, like a playbook. And I think part of what your book really communicates for me at least, is that like the playbook is a more comprehensive circumstantial relationship to whoever you are trying to be, whether you're a brand or a person on the internet and how you respond as long as you have some type of, you've developed some type of strategy like, okay, I don't respond to particular types of trolls, but when there's somebody that's framing a, you know, bad take in good faith, I'll respond to them to kind of build yeah. my response or whatever. Um, that there's like, there, there, there are, I don't know, I don't want to sound cheesy, but like emergent, um, yeah, emergent best practices or something. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think one thing that um, that my, you know, I had a sort of funny interaction. Um, I released, so when, before Michael Schellenberger testified in front of that congressional committee, I he had engaged in a relationship with me starting in December. It went from December till about March when he wrote his <laughs> lunatic congressional testimony, um, where he was asking me content moderation questions. So I was sort of like, oh, like a, like a source relationship, just off the record. Like we're going to have conversations about content moderation. And I answered his questions as he was doing this, this, uh, this, this Twitter files process, because again, I felt like, okay, you know, I, I don't care about the ideological alignment of the writer so much as I care about these topics being communicated accurately and helping people understand who have no familiarity with content moderation, why a decision might've been made. And so when this congressional testimony comes out and it wildly misrepresents my viewpoint on many, many, many issues. Um, and then he goes on Joe Rogan to reiterate those uh, opinions that I do not hold and attribute them to me and say, I, you know, CIA agent rose to the highest levels of the intelligence community, um, you know, implied like that there was something nefarious about how I had my job and, 
you know, really elevated some of the right wing cranks who'd written stuff about us up to the level of like whistleblowers who ran cyber at the State Department, all this nonsense. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to release all of my text messages with this person. I'm going to put out 100% of everything I said, everything, not not varnished, not cherry picked. No, no, no. Here is literally the WhatsApp text dump. <laughs> Here's the text file. Go ahead, go read it. And it's because I felt like that was in that moment the best possible response I had. It was not to engage in a back and forth with him directly, but it was to say, as you read this, you need to understand that this is what I actually said. Here is what actually happened. Compare the exchanges here with the characterization of the exchanges over here. That's the only thing I can really do, right, is let the audience make up their mind um, with the data. You know, I think... Um, comms was horrified that I wanted to do this, but I said, no, this is, this is actually very important to me, right? I want, I want that out there. I, I really want that out there. I want people to understand it. And I think that it's not necessarily the right strategy for everybody, but you don't have to engage in the back and forth with the person who is doing the smear, but you do have to get enough out there so that if people go search for it or go search for you, that at least they can see that this interaction or that person's claim is not exactly on the up and up and to, to give them more context. The problem with the internet is that it is essentially like a a context-free environment. You, I don't know if this ever happens to you, but I'll remember something and I'll be like, oh yeah, wasn't there a story about that from like 2021? And you're, you know, you're on Google and you're searching the terms and you're trying to find the article and you don't know if you have the name quite right. You can't quite find it, but it's like stuck in your head. And you're like, there's no easy way to, to pull out through lines. And it is so much, um, so much of, of the internet is biased towards recency. And totally. that is a big challenge for uh, for trying to get added context out there into the world. Totally. And the deluge, I mean, you referenced Naomi Klein, um, and I'm thinking of Doppelganger, like the deluge of information sometimes can lead to things that are otherwise very easy to disabuse people of, just sort of become like their own, they take on their own sort of incorrect lore. On this, on this note, because you've been so prescient about the evolution of social media. Like I'm thinking back to, you wrote a piece, I think it was in 2020 or 2021 about um, the, the real threat of generative AI to the information sphere is the dropping of the cost to zero and the kind of just like endless stream of possible bullshit rather than the kind of what everybody was freaked out about, the kind of like high end deep fake, like, you know, a, a yeah. political leader saying. So like, what's the that of now? Like, what's the thing you're observing now? <laughs> People are still fighting about that. I actually I got this media request um, from the Times, and now I'm waiting with bated breath to see how they characterize my responses. Because um, <laughs> I got one of these like, um, "Hey, your book weighs in on a lot of these things. Here are these questions we have." And the questions were, um, you know, basically like, "What is the future?" Sort of, sort of like the question you're asking me. And and one of the questions was very funny, which was like, "Generative AI is like the dog that didn't bark. Like nothing happened. You know, how should we think about the fact that nothing happened?" And I thought this is sort of a funny question to get because I was like, one, I, I have been on the record for a very long time saying that I think the threat profile is different. I think the threat profile is actually to the mass erosion of trust, right? Mm -hmm. That it will, in fact, reinforce trust being a very siloed thing in the sense that you cannot know what is true. And we saw that play out, unfortunately, like around October 7th uh, in Israel, the, the Israel-Gaza conflict, there were some images that came out that were dismissed as false when they were, in fact, real. And that's because an AI-generated... Uh, image analyzer uh, was sort of fooled by some pixelation to cover some, you know, uh, some some gore, and and that that um, this sort of lie went viral then, uh, or this misinformation or whatever rumor you want to call it, um, saying that the people who had shared the image were uh, sort of like you know serving Israeli government with its propaganda machine, right? And and so you see that again that that sort of like what I articulated there is exactly what happened, right? It, it just makes it very hard to know what is real and what is not real. But this question of like, um, oh, it's got no impact. You know, I, I think it's sort of funny because I'm like, okay, it's September 17th, right? We haven't even hit October yet. There's, it's called the October surprise for a reason. Maybe we should yeah, so give it some time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so two things can simultaneously be true. One, it's a hugely impactful technology uh, from a trust perspective. I think it, it's going to exacerbate some of the challenges that we have with trust. Two, it may still prove useful for political manipulators in an American election 
I would envision that happening in one of two ways. First would be fake leaked audio, right? Some fake Kamala Harris hot mic or fake Donald Trump hot mic where the candidate is made to say something they didn't say, you know, probably maybe 48 hours before people go to the polls. Um, the other area where it becomes potentially interesting, though, is a lot of the rumors that we saw in 2020 and 2022 about um, rigged machines and people passing thumb drives to switch votes or like ballots being destroyed, all that stuff. You can potentially now, and if not now, then definitely four years from now, produce very, very plausible image mm. and audio and video collateral to support those rumors. So you're, you're, you know, there may be a real rumor that comes out, but then people are going to go look for the collateral to justify the belief that uh, that they hold, which is going to be in alignment with what they want an outcome of an election to be, for example. So that that's how I would see it playing out. Um, I think, you know, the we're in an adaptation period now, and that's how we need to be thinking about this. I just think it's funny that media keeps coming to me with like, you know, nothing happened. It's done. This was all overblown. I'm like, yeah, okay. I mean, like, yes, and, you know. <laughs> well, I actually, I, I sort of disagree with the premise because sure, we haven't had some major, you know, uh, overt political fuckery turn into like a big moment, mm -hmm. but there has been this proliferation of AI slop that has really disoriented people. Like we've seen, particularly on Facebook and particularly with older folks, though not exclusively, you know, them sending something to the, the stories of them sending something to their kid and the kid being like, this is totally fake. Like all of yeah. this is fake. But it's, it's not that it's, it doesn't have a political agenda in, in a direct like for a campaign type of way, but it is creating a, a groundwork where either you don't know if something is true and you're conditioned to sort of doubt everything, which is not great for consensus as you outline in the book, um, or you are demonstrating yourself to be really gullible and you're sort of being conditioned into this gullibility pipeline where then when there is something like what you're describing, it hits. Yeah. And we wrote, my my uh, colleague Josh Goldstein at Georgetown and I wrote this paper on that, actually just looking at the spam and scams. And I think I actually answered back, I think in my paragraph long answer that I sent back to that question from the Times, I think I did say exactly this, right? It's We haven't seen it in the political realm, but like that doesn't mean that it's not having trust impacts in areas where it counts like spam and scams, or as I alluded to earlier in our chat, um, the impact on women and children when mm -hmm. AI generated nudes are becoming uh, a very prevalent form of, uh, of harassment. And so that too is where you're starting to see, um, you know, for, for people who find their images, you know, abused in this way, or this, this form of harassment where those images are put up, um, they are in the position of having to prove that they're not real. This is, again, kind of like what we were talking about a few minutes ago, right, where the onus is really on the target to reset the narrative, correct the record, because there is nothing that is uh, going to do that for you. And so with the, you know, with the AI generated uh, nudes and things, you know, you've seen like teachers come forward and say like, you know, I, like they're not public figures. They don't have large megaphones. They don't have the ability to just, you know, drop the facts on a sub stack and have that be the the top Google search result for the query. And so they're impacted by this in, in pretty profound ways. So AI generated content is having an impact on social trust. It is having an impact on society. It is something that this is why platforms are scrambling to think about what combination of watermarking and provenance and, you know, throttling and other mechanisms they can take to, to think about the distribution. Even as again, you know, we, we might not have had a, election smoking gun type scenario yet. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, a colleague, um, you know, we've been connected on, on the internet as a tech journalist. She had this happen to her. And of course she's in an ideal position right. to get ahead of it because she can just put that, you know, ra that ransom, that, that, uh, deep fake nudes ransom on blast. And there was a sort of media moment, but she even described the way in which it obviously like viscerally impacted her, even just seeing, even just seeing herself depicted that way and knowing that somebody was kind of coming at her that way and thinking about that intimidation at mass scale, particularly as you said, for women and children. Um, but for anyone is, yeah, it's really haunting. And I think it gets discounted because it's not one of the, because specifically because it's happening behind the scenes, we right. don't know how many people that it's currently happening to until they, right. you know, until people start to come out. Um, anyway, 
I feel like I could talk to you about this, all of this stuff forever, 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 but I, <laughs> but I do want to be conscious of time. Um, and you've been so generous with your time. I have three questions that I like to end every episode with. Obviously you've hit on these questions throughout. So feel free to call those back in, take it somewhere else. Um, however you see fit. Um, the first is what is one thing you wish people paid more attention to? Through lines. <laughs> I know it's like a, maybe a cop out answer, but, um, I think that there's a lot of, you know, something, something breaks and it's the most important thing in the world. And we have to all respond to it right now. Maybe like the combination of through lines and, and pausing, um, just being more mindful about how we choose to engage, what we choose to share. Um, and that, uh, that, that, the value of friction, the value of things being a little bit slower. I would like to see people pay a bit more attention to that and to, to think about what their role is in this ecosystem, particularly in, in context. Mm. All right. What is one resource that you would recommend or that you use to make better sense of reality? I spend a lot of time on Internet Archive and Wikipedia. Uh, both for that that sort of through line piece. Wikipedia, I appreciate for its transparency. You can kind of go and see if an edit's been made. And I look at the history pages a lot when I'm reading something on Wikipedia. Um, I appreciate that it has frameworks, transparent frameworks for sourcing. Um, so I, I I know that it's funny because I remember I have a kid in um, fifth grade now. And, you know, Wikipedia is not a source. Like there's still a... Um, I mean, like a, a bias towards more established sources, but I do use it quite a bit as far as uh, understanding information and context. The other thing I uh, I do is I, I do visit multiple platforms if something is breaking to try to understand um, how is this being processed on these these different platforms where there'll be a different perception so that I get a little bit more of that, um, that perspective and maybe see... Uh, you know, see information I otherwise wouldn't have seen, see the fact check I otherwise wouldn't have seen. Even a community note can be very helpful. So yeah, mm. so I'm, I'm a, um, I also really do the wait before you comment thing. Like I'm very much a, um, the internet doesn't, doesn't need my take in this, <laughs> this immediate second, uh, yeah. because so often things aren't quite what you see at first. Yeah. I have many critiques of Elon's handling of Twitter, but community notes is, I can, I can concede that that was, um, that's a helpful feature of the, of the app. Yeah, totally. Um, also, it's funny you bring up Internet Archive. Um, Taylor Lorenz, our mutual friend, brought up, uh, I think, Wayback Machine particularly for that answer. But Internet yeah, Archive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, again, it's just like a um, what was this thing before? You know, what was this domain before? Where did it come from? For the ones where I'm like, what even is this news organization? <laughs> is it real? I've never heard of it before. You know, there's so many of these, like especially on Twitter where it has a blue check and you're like, is this real? Um, I do find the internet archive just to get a little bit of like a fuller perspective. Um, how long has it been in existence? You know, what did its landing page look like? Does it have a transparency disclosure that disappeared later? You know, these sorts of things. Totally. Totally. And finally, what is one moment when your sense of reality was disrupted? Um, that's another really, really good question. I, I think I don't, I don't know if it's a specific, like if there's a specific moment, um, because this is like what I look at, you know, day in and day out for, for many years now, but there's, there's moments when, you know, even this, um, this latest, um, sort of meme slash, um, narrative warfare around people eating cats. Right. And then the, the, um, the image, you know, there was like a, uh, so of course it goes through, there's multiple phases of this particular fight, right? There's the actual allegation, there's the harm that's kind of happening to the community as these bomb threats and things are being called in. There's the sort of jokey, ironic collateral that begins to come out that is obviously fake of like, you know, Trump waiting in a pond with ducks and things. Um, then there is though like the calls for evidence and then you see these images of like animals on a grill making their way across twitter and people are sitting there zooming in fighting about whether that's a chicken foot well you know <laughs> on the grill or like if that's a wing and you know and i sit there and i and i and i find myself like zooming in and looking at these things too while also feeling like the you know the the sort of obsession with facts again 
that's not the plot. That's not what this is actually about. That's not what's actually happening here. So I try to both be cognizant of, you know, to the best extent possible, getting at the facts and ascertaining what reality is while also um, thinking about the the kind of context in which some of these um, some of these claims are shared and, and what the what the bigger kind of what the bigger picture is, what the bigger goal is. So in that in that context, I definitely having watched AI generated content evolve over a period of years now, things that we used to treat as tells are no longer tells. They're, mm. you know, the fingers are generally fairly accurate. The uh, the hyper realistic skin is being replaced by AI generated blemishes, right? So um so I'm very aware of like the limitation of my ability to determine whether something is real or not based solely on the image. And again, that question of what is the purpose of this? What is the, like, what, what, what is the role this image is serving is something that I'm um, sort of that, that, that second order understanding is something I'm much more um, try to pay much more attention to. Mm. Well, wise words. I'll be thinking about that. Um, Thank you so much for being on Urgent Futures. Um, everybody should go get Invisible Rulers right now for an understanding of the social media waters you are wading in. Uh, are there any announcements associated with the book or other things you have on the horizon that people should be aware of? No, I'm just, um, I have a newsletter I don't update as often as I should, but that means it's very light follow. <laughs> and that's just on on my website, on renedoresta.com. And I try to put out um, once a month or so, sort of like a synthesis of things I'm working on. So this month, it'll probably be actually a lot about uh, the different Kind of Russia announcements made by um, State Department and DOJ this month, and just kind of connecting the dots back to some of the stuff that uh, that's happened in that space over the last few years. Um, but now I've got, you know, that's where I will post about papers and things that are coming up also. And then as far as on social media, I'm mostly on Threads, Blue Sky, and Mastodon. So. All right, find her there, Renee. Thank you so much for being on Urgent Futures. Thank you for having me. This podcast is edited and produced by Adam Labrie and me, Jesse Damiani. The podcast is presented by Reality Studies. You can learn more by visiting realitystudies.co. And if you appreciate the work I'm doing, please subscribe and share it with someone you think would enjoy it.